Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inusor Education. Um, we continue talking about probabilities uh, today. This is about conditional probability. And uh, this lecture is part of the Advanced Math for Teenagers course presented on unizor.com. And that's where I recommend you to, to go to listen to this lecture. Um, it has notes, and notes are very, very useful. So you might actually choose to read the notes before you listen to the lecture, and then listen to the lecture, and then read the notes again. <laughs> anyway, um, so let's talk about conditional probability. Um, I have this plan, which I'm going to use, and here is my first statement. Um, if you have certain random experiment and you have absolutely no knowledge about um, results of this experiment you did not conduct this experiment in the past so you don't know the frequencies of occurring different uh, different uh, elementary events um, you don't have any knowledge about the particular features of this experiment so you cannot really predict with any certainty um, the one result over another so, you must assume that if you are really uh, assigned the task to uh, set the probabilities of different elementary events, which are the outcomes of this experiment, you basically have absolutely no choice but to assign them exactly the same probabilities. That's the start, right? Um, so, if you have a random experiment with n different um, elementary events which are the results of this experiment and you have no reason to believe that one is, uh, uh, is tending to occur more often than another then you obviously have to assign the probability of every elementary event equals to 1 over n. Alright, now that obviously happens with flipping the coins, uh, rolling the dice, uh, shuffling the deck of cards, etc, etc. Alright, fine. So, um, now, we have actually spent some time and um, decided to put it on a little bit more formal, more mathematical uh, standpoint. And our um, approach was as follows the set of elementary events which we um, called um, sample space we have basically equivalent, uh, made an equivalency between the sample, uh, uh, sample space and a set. Well, this is a set of elementary events. Set can have many different types of um, elements. So, why not elementary event to be an element of this set? So, that's one thing. The second thing is the probability of this elementary event which happens to be 1 over n, if there are n elements in a set, n elements, is basically a measure a measure introduced, introduced on the elements of this particular set in as much as we can measure the area or the angle or we can me measure the speed or anything whatever we can measure so the measure is an, a, a numerical weight if you wish of each elementary event so basically we have associated a number number one over n with every element we also consider every random event which is basically a combination of elementary events. Well, what is a combination of different elements in the set is a subset, right? 
So any random event is treated as a subset of our set. Our set or is basically an equivalent of the sample space, which is a set of all the elementary events. And what's important is that the measure should be additive. Which means if you have certain random event which contains certain elements, then the measure of the random element, uh, measure of this um, uh, random event, the subset is equal to a sum of all the elements which comprise this uh, particular uh, subset. And if you have two subsets, if they do not have common elements, then you just add the measure of uh, each of them to get the combined subset, which we have introduced as an operation OR, for instance. Or, in some other cases, you can manipulate in, in, in a similar fashion. With, with the measure. So measure is additive. It means it can be added up in exactly the same fashion as you uh, are adding up areas of different figures. If you put them together, if they don't intersect, then the measure of the, uh, of the result is the sum of the measures of the components. All right, so I will use this measure theory equivalent or formalization of the theory of probabilities. Um, in the course of explanation of what exactly the conditional probability actually is. Uh, maybe not in this lecture, uh, but definitely in some other lectures dedicated to conditional probabilities. All right. Next. What's next is the following. Um, you um, have assigned initially the probability of each of the n elements uh, of each uh, elementary event, uh, the probability would be equal to 1 over n, because you don't have any knowledge about what's going on. But let's consider you do. Let's consider that, for instance, you can conduct this experiment time after time after time, and you accumulated statistics, and you see that one elementary event occurs more often than others for whatever reason. Well, that's the reason for you to reassign the probabilities slightly differently. So instead of getting one nth uh, for, for each elementary event, you might redistribute this probability and put a little bit more into the elementary event which occurs more frequently. Um, now, there might be even some cases when certain elementary events don't occur at all. Well, then that's the reason to assign the probability of zero to these elementary events. Let me just give you an example. Let's say you are rolling the dice and you have decided that, well, you don't know how the dice will fall. So you have decided to use the first 10 digits as the result of this experiment. Yeah, but yeah, you can tell me that there are only six sides on the, on, on the dice and there are numbers from one to six. Why did I include this? Well, number one, because I have the right to include anything I want into my set of elementary events. But now, if I am a reasonable person, I should assign the probability of one six to this, one six to this, one six to this, and zero, 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 and zero to all these guys, which basically never occur. So it's not wrong to include certain um, uh, elements uh, in, in your uh, original uh, set of elementary events, as long as you know what's the probability of these. And if they are impossible, well, I mean, there are certain cases. Maybe rolling of the dice is not um, such a good example because it's obvious that 7, 8, 9, 10 cannot actually occur. But in some other cases, that might not be such an obvious case. So you are free to basically uh, assign the probabilities to, to any events as long as these probabilities correspond to either your experience, uh, how you observe, uh, in the past, or your knowledge about the internal structure of the uh, of, of your experiment. So your knowledge about the internal structure 
of, of the dice is that it has only six uh, sides, so it cannot actually have seven, eight, nine, and ten. So if somebody wants to include these elementary events as the results, that's fine, they're free to do it, as long as they assign the probability of zero. So that's another point. So the probabilities are changing. That's what's most important. As long as you know something about your experiment, your probabilities might deviate from the original um, uh, equal distribution among the elementary events to something else. That's a very important observation, actually. Now, um, I actually would like to use my um, equivalent with a set theory um, to, to put it in some kind of a um, more picturesque format. How can you actually graphically represent what, what I just said? Well, uh, for instance, you can do it this way. Let's say you have certain area divided into certain parts. Now, each small area represents represents an individual um, outcome of your experiment. So in this case I have whatever, 12 different uh, areas. So I can assign the probability of 1 12 to each of these little squares. Now there are 12 squares, so the total probability of all this is equal to 1. Now each square represents an elementary event. Now the combination of the elementary events is basically some kind of random event, right? So I can say that the combination of uh, this, 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 and this, these, it represents the event. Now, some of these numbers, which are inside, it's one twelfth, uh, how many, seven times, represents basically the probability of um, the event itself, because as we know, the probability is an additive measure. So it's exactly like the area. So the area of this figure is equal to sum of areas of little uh, squares inside, right? So basically, this type of representation of the probability is very useful because it actually um, implies this additive feature of probability. As long as you know how to um, uh, draw some picture which represents the results of your experiment and you assign the probability of each individual elementary event, then by combining elements into some kind of figures you can always come up with a, a, a picture representation, the graphical representation of, of the event you're interested in. And the probability of this event is very easily calculated basically exactly like the area of something. Now, if for whatever reason the probabilities are changed, so instead of one twelfth to each one of those, I have, let's say, I don't know, zero, zero, I have zero, 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 and zero, and the rest I have one eighth. One eighth, one eighth. Now, I have exactly the same event as before, but now the probability is 0, 0, 0, and 3 times 8, so it's 3 eighths, instead of, as it was before, 7 twelfths, right? So, the graphical representation is very convenient, uh, because it really reflects how every event um, has the probability equal to the sum of the elementary events' probabilities, which comprise this bigger event. So I'll, I'm going to use this graphical representation in the future. So I did not really touch the conditional probability yet, but I'm still kind of trying to introduce you to certain concepts which would lead me to introduction of the, of the conditional probability. All right. So um, we have actually touched um, a particular case when uh, from the initial distribution of, the, uh, of probabilities among elementary events we can switch to something new based on the knowledge or frequency or whatever else um, which we have. And let me just give you an example. 
uh, of certain uh, case when uh, something uh, becomes uh, impossible. Okay, let's consider we have a special dice. A special dice, when it's rolled, it shows only even numbers, 2, 4, and 6. Now, the odd numbers are not actually shown. And uh, therefore, my distribution of probabilities, instead of 1, 6 to each, should actually be switched to 0, 1 third, 0, 1 third, 0, and 1 third. So I have three possible outcomes, 2, 4, and 6, and three impossible, 0, 3, and 5. That's why I have assigned the probabilities of impossible events to 0. Now, it doesn't really matter whether I can make such a uh, dice or not. This is a purely theoretical consideration. So, um, that actually is an example of how exactly the redistribution of probabilities occur based on some knowledge. So what's my knowledge? And here is the link to the conditional probability. What is my condition? Condition is, or my prior knowledge if you wish, about the experiment is that this is a special dice and it falls only to show the uh, even numbers on the top. So under this condition the probabilities have different values as you see. Right? So this is basically a, an example. Now, another example, a little bit more practical, because you can say that, well, it's probably impossible to have this dice, etc. But here is a practical example. Let's say you are playing blackjack, and uh, you're not the only player. There is a player before you, so you're number two, let's say. So the dealer first gives the card to the number one, and then gives the card to the number two. Now, if you just don't know anything at all what's the probability of getting a king let's say you're playing with one standard deck of cards of 52 cards so you have 52 cards and as far as the kings go there are four different kings in four different suits right so if you don't know anything about anything at all you would consider that the probability to get the king would be four fifty seconds Right? Because there are four kings uh, out of 52 cards, so the probability to get the king would be this. But what if you observe that the person, number one, who actually got the card before you, got the king? Well, under this condition, there are only three remaining kings, right? So the combination. Um, uh, uh, this particular condition uh, that the first player got the king makes your probability instead of 4 uh, 350 seconds right? so again the prior knowledge or certain condition which you might not actually be aware of in the beginning but now if you are aware of these condition that changes the probability of the event which you are interested in I mean, obviously, the elementary events are changed, uh, uh, everything is changed. I mean, as long as you know that the first guy got a particular card, that changes completely the probability of everything else for you and for all other players if they are there. But again, if you don't know anything about what exactly that first person received, you have absolutely no information about getting anything and you would probably decide, decide that your probability is still 450 seconds. All right, so that's just examples of how um, knowledge about something or statistical experience or whatever else, um, which basically represents certain condition your experiment is um, uh, actually conducted how that changes the probabilities of elementary events and, and any random event. So these are just examples. All right, next we will do a little bit more uh, precise one particular example, and I will use the graphical representation which I have. Let's say you're playing 
uh, with two dice and I will represent graphically the results in this way. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I have two dice, and the result of my experiment would be in these squares. And the square has row and column. Row means the first dice result, and the column means the second dice result. So if I throw a dice and I have a combination three, four, so it would be three, four, that's the square which represents the result. So the results of my experiment are in this 6 by 6 matrix, 36 different uh, squares, and if I don't know anything about how the whole experiment actually is conducted, then I can say that 136 is the probability associated with each uh, particular result. So each square has an area of 136, I have 36 squares, so all together we have one, as it's supposed to be. And now if I would like to know, let's say, what's the probability of having, um, let's say, uh, even number on a second uh, dice. So the second one, which is the column, should be even. All right, so it's, and I don't care about the results of the first one, right? So this square and this square and this and this and this and this represent the results of the uh, my experiment if the second dice is two now these are the result is four the first one is irrelevant and this is the results is six so all these squares, which are marked with a point, represent an event. It's a combination of elementary events. So each one of these is elementary event, when the first dice falls whatever it wants, and the second one is even, right? So that's what I have. Now, if I would like to know the probability of the second dice to be even, I just have to add together the measures of each of the pointed square, and there are uh, 6, 6, 6, 18 uh, pointed squares, so the probability is a sum of 18 by 136, so it's 1836, which is 1, 2, 1 over 2. So, with a probability of 1 half, if I throw two dice, I have the second dice even. All right, fine. That's unconditional. That's when I don't know anything about the dice. Now, let's consider a slightly different case. What if my dice are special and they are so special that their sum, so the dice number one plus dice number two, always comes to six. Now, by the way, it can be actually practical. I mean, you can say that this is impossible to have such two dice that will always, always fall in a way that the sum is equal to 6. But I can make a different experiment. I can just completely disregard all the events, or all the experiments when the result is not 6. So I'm throwing the dice, a, a pair of dice, time, time after time. If the sum is equal to 6, I consider this to be my experiment. And I don't count anything else. Right? So basically, my experiment is only this. So I'm on the condition that two dice always come up, always sum up with uh, the, to, to a sum of six. Now, what does it mean? Well, it means that I have to completely redistribute my, um, uh, uh, my probabilities. Instead of 136 to each one of them, I have to redistribute it differently because there are only how many? 1, 5, give me 6 in sum, right? 2, 4, 3, 3, 4, 2, 
and 5, 1. So only these results of two dice give me a sum of 6. So only these 5. So what does it mean? It means that I have to assign the probability of 0 to anything else and the probability of 5 of them, right? So 1 fifth to, to these combinations. So 1 5 should have the probability of 1 fifth. 2 4 3 3 4 1 4 2 and 5 1. These are only possible choices which I have. Everything else is impossible, which means everything else is zero. So all elementary events which are not marked with one fifth actually have the probability of zero. This condition actually completely changes the distribution of probabilities among events. Without this condition that the sum is equal to 6, each of these squares have the probability 136. Now, under this condition, the probabilities are changed and these guys have 1 fifth and everything else has 0. So, what is the probability of having uh, even number as the second dice result. Well, let's just see. I have this one, 4, 2, and I have this one, 2, 4. That's the second one is even. All other cases are either impossible, I mean this, 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 and all of these are impossible they do have zero probability, right? So, if I will start adding, this has zero, 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 zero. If I will start adding all elementary events which comprise my, um, uh, the result which I'm interested in, that the second dice is, is even, I will have to really add all these which are in blue but these are zeros right so only these are important so what's important is this one and this one right out of these which are my result which i'm interested in only these two have non-zero probability so i have only two out of five and my conditional probability of having the second um, dice uh, as an even number, my conditional probability under the condition that the sum of two dice is six is equal to two fifths, not one half as, used, as, as was before. So, as you see, my condition which I have imposed on my experiment has changed the all elementary events, now all elementary events are either one-fifth or zero, and as a result it changed the uh, probability of the event I'm interested in. So the second dice shows the even number. So that was my illustrative example of how condition changes the uh, probabilities associated with the results of experiment. All right. So, um, let me just summarize this, with, uh, this lecture. If you don't know anything about the random experiments which you are conducting, then you are forced basically to assign even probabilities to all the uh, outcomes. And if you have n outcomes, you have 1 over n uh, as a probability of each one of them. But if you have certain knowledge, like for instance knowledge that these are special dice which sum always to six. That knowledge completely changes the, element, the, the probabilities of elementary events and as a result it changes the probabilities of your, um, uh, of, of your uh, events which you are interested in. So the conditional probability is this changed probability 
based on the knowledge about certain conditions which you have. And graphically, it might be represented as a table, or in next lecture when I will be going into more details, it will be actually represented in the language of the set theory, which I was trying to um, just touch uh, once before. Well, that's basically it for this introductory into what conditional probability actually is. Conditional probability is the changed probability of the events based on certain knowledge, certain conditions which you impose on your uh, random experiment. And this is an example of how to apply this particular conditional probability, how to calculate it. Well, that's it. I do suggest you to read again this lecture on unisor.com in the notes for this uh, particular lecture. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much and good luck.